Hey podcast, today we're going to be learning about HR and parking. I think anyone that's been in the industry long enough knows that um, if you're in parking, you one of the most attractive things about it and most difficult is the fact that you have to wear lots of different hats. And you really need to be a jack of all trades when it comes to uh, business, management, um, you're doing sales, managing construction, you name it, you're going to touch it in some way when you're dealing with parking. And uh, from an HR perspective, there's lots of challenges that go along with that. So Sit back. Hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Parker X. This is Lester Mascon, and we're sitting here with Tanya Thompson. Hello. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining us. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> So today with uh, Tanya is going to help us out and we're going to talk a little bit about HR and parking. So how long have you been in HR? So um, it, I started out in payroll Okay. Um, back in 2000. Um, I worked for one of the larger payroll processing companies that actually also does human resources. So I had um, access to that um, early on in my career, okay. but it was at that time, it was the specialty it was in was in payroll, and then it's kind of a nice foundation for HR though, because most HR organizations handle the payroll side as right. well. Right, and some some places sometimes it's in accounting, okay. but they still do have um, you know questions and things that go to HR with when it comes to laws and payroll laws and things like that. But yeah, and that's really where it came from. So. Um, we had a lot of clients there that would ask HR questions and we would filter those through to our HR folks. And so okay. that's how I had access initially to human resources and where I fell in love with it. So Nice. Mm -hmm. So after that, um, when you moved on to actual, moved on from there, what was the... So I moved to Century Control Systems. Okay. Um, and I, initially I started there as their payroll okay. person as well. Very quickly did they realize I could do HR stuff as well. So I would say probably <laughs> three months in, they just started pouring the, the HR tasks on me as well, which was, I was completely fine with. I was super excited about. And I think working for, not and now I've worked for them for 12 years, almost 13. So uh, things have just grown from there. And they gave me the opportunity to grow um, and allowing me to learn by doing so it's been it's been a ride but you've gone back and gotten some formal yeah. education as oh, well yeah. yeah so during the time you know I've HR certified certifications I've taken um, uh, human resources management certificate programs you have to when you have when you're certified when you have certification you have to keep up with recertification credits okay so um, seminars, classes, all kinds of things um, that I've done along the way as I've well. I've always thought about going back to like business school, but um, I remember working for Tim, it was always like, hey, you've learned more. Doing. Doing and all yep. the practical application stuff. But mm -hmm. uh, not that I wouldn't like to still do it, but yeah, the practical application really does make a difference. Right, big you've difference. You've actually been an operator. Yeah, big difference. So uh, our audience um, on Parker X is mostly people in the parking industry. They're owners, they're operators, they're parks equipment companies. And, and I had a, I wanted to go through a few HR topics with you just to try to provide some clarity and education okay. kind of around different things. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about was when you're hiring practices and writing job descriptions. So every time I've gone to hire someone and I've sat down and I've written through their job description and everything, because parking is such a I know people don't think about it as much, but it's such a diverse skill set. Like mm -hmm. you need to know so many different, like small pieces of so many different things, whether you're, like I said, whether you're an operator, whether you're a project manager, whatever it is, like you really have to know a lot right. about a lot of different things. And when you go to write a job description, it's hard. It's really challenging. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how do you go about, so I'm thinking about somebody that I want to hire and I, I think there's a primary focus, but there's all these secondary things that I really need them to have a little bit of knowledge in. How do I go about doing that to try to find someone that's going to be a good fit? So you have to decide um, coming in what 
what the requirements are, what the qualifications are coming in, what do they need coming in. Um, and then there'll be some things that are trainable. So you have to go through the qualifications and determine that from those list of things, that exactly that. Um, because there, sometimes you think that it's a requirement, you know, say for instance, you're hiring a project manager, um, that they need to have worked on big projects or in technology or in parking. Um, but some of that stuff can be trained if they've done project management before or ever they may be. So it just really takes the work there. Now, when you're a small organization, you kind of have to have hybrid positions. So they might need to be a little bit of a service technician. They need to be able to take the equipment apart and still do project management. Yes, that there are people out there. It's not impossible to find, but it, it's it's harder to find if you're not looking in parking. So, I mean, they need to have good written and oral skills and mm -hmm. be able to communicate directly with clients and everything. Like you, once you start putting it all together, you end up with this man. If they haven't been in parking or doing the job that you're asking them to do already, I mean, good luck trying to find them. And then if you do find them. Well, that's what they're I, not going to be achieved. Well, that's what I mean. You know, you have to decide which of those qualifications are most important, and even grade them, because you you know you might come, you might realize that there are some of those things that you think. I mean, yes, of course, when you're talking about a project manager, they have to, you know, have good writing skills and speaking skills and things like that. Um, but they may maybe they don't need the education that you have listed. Um, maybe that doesn't need, like I said before, maybe it doesn't need to be in parking or even in construction, some, some other form of project management, but there are certain things that will be an absolute must and you have to determine what those are. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it, the best thing I can do is just find, um, so say for instance, we are looking for a project manager, find someone that's coming from like the electrical industry or something like that and mm -hmm. go, okay this is what we're going to target and here's the list of things that I'm just going to go back and try to work on with them later. Right. Do I put them in the job description or no? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, you need to, the job descriptions need to be realistic of what they're really going to do. And, and it's, it's a working document. It's going to change as time goes along. So it's not something that's set in stone either. And especially when it's a new position. So you have to realize you're putting this down to hire this person and it will, it can and will probably change as the, what, after you hire the, yeah, after you hire the person and you realize what you really needed. Um, so you have to think about that as well. And that's why it's important to figure out what initially what is needed up front and then what's trainable. Because you might determine that you, this hybrid position is just too much for one person and you really need to separate it out into two people. Is it better to find people that already know how to do everything you need and you don't have to train or is it, or is it easier, better to train people and... It depends. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes somebody coming in, it's kind of, they, I mean, even though they might have done it before, it can be can feel like baggage. Because the ramp up <laughs> time is immense with someone who doesn't know the industry very well. Right. But they might have in th their way of doing things. Um, so sometimes training somebody. They might have bad habits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So... Sometimes it's just better to find somebody that's qualified, maybe not entry level, but maybe, you know, a couple years of experience um, and train them on how to do it versus thinking you're going to get this perfect candidate. So it's a really good leading question, you know, after talking about job descriptions and everything. And then the next piece that we always, I think people have to deal with a lot is prevailing wage. Right. Uh, maybe more of uh, more construction related stuff, but I mean, what a, when you get a prevailing wage project, I mean, first, how do you know? And then two, what, what are the next steps? Well, one of the things is that people, um, as you, as you, you talk about it, it's not prevailing wage, it's public works. So we have to think about all of the requirements and it depends on what state. So we're in California, so we'll talk a little bit about California, but there's different, depending on where you are in the country, they, it could be a little <clears> bit different, but. Um, so every we, state, every, there's different for every state? Uh, well, I would say a lot of the states fall under the federal law. Okay. So, which to tell you the truth is a little bit easier than in, say for instance, in Washington or in California. Okay. Um, 
I wouldn't say easier, but it, it, I mean, there's, there's Rules less steps. More clear. There's less, just less administrative burden um, okay. when it comes to the projects. Um, but in California, there it's, you have to be, you have to determine if the project is public work. So was it partially funded at all? So that could be a loan, it could be a grant, it could be anything that's um, public money, or it could be that it's a privately funded, um, but it's a public building, then it could be also yeah. considered public works. Um, then there's also, you know, um, projects that are not public works, but the contractor wants everybody to treat it by contract like it's a public works contract. So um, they require you to pay prevailing wages and things and like prevailing that. prevailing wage, that pretty much applies just to the trades, right? Right. So if you pick up a tool, okay, typically it's going to be public it's going to be prevailing wage so, so electrical communications worker mason correct all these things are covered by prevailing wage right. laws. where it gets a little tricky is when you, you talk about software engineers and things because oftentimes in parking or in our industry they are doing both so they might you know start working on a you know a server or something and then step over and do some work on the um equipment Right. So that is then changes into public works. I mean, the, you have to you have to determine. So oftentimes we're not looking at what they're doing. We're just paying them a straight wage. So now you're required to look at your technicians to see right now they're doing software work. Then they're doing, um, say, for instance, electrical work um, and pay them appropriately, um, which gets a little hard. It, it's hard to do. It really is. Um, and then on top of that, there's administratively, there's a lot of stuff in the background that's happening that have really nothing to do with the technicians. You're required to, on public works contracts in California, you're required to register your um, contracts with the state. You're required to register them with um, the apprenticeship program. You're required to request a pr an apprenticeship on the project. Um, so wait, you have to request apprenticeship? Yes. So you have to request, you have to, the, the law is that you have to request <laughs> it. It okay. doesn't mean that they will send one. And the reason why I say that is because um, you have to become part of an apprenticeship program, but you're not required, the law doesn't require you to become part of that program. Okay. So even though you have to request it, they're, they're not going to send you one from their program unless you sign their contracts to be, be part of their program. Got it. Now, there are some counties um, that Santa will. Santa Barbara, I think. Yeah. yeah I, was <laughs> I wasn't going to throw them under the bus, <laughs> but yes, Santa Barbara, they will try to send you anyone. Even if it's, I mean, oftentimes these people can't do the work because they have to be factory trained. They have to, there's a lot of sure. training that happens. And then these projects, you know, you're, 100 hours total and you have to have them on there for you know 20 hours well there's not enough time to train these people so then what are they doing if they're if they are actually dispatched what sweeping you know i mean they can't really do but much. you've got to meet all these requirements if you're going to do public works projects right and you have to hire that if if they're dispatched you have to hire them onto your payroll and you have to know to put these things in your cost assumptions as well right so um and sometimes, again, it's just an additional expense because they're not going to be doing anything. You still have to, your employees have to still do I know work. that's not the intent of the law probably, no. but the, if you're doing one-off project and, you know, wherever and you have to do this, and you're right, I mean, you're not going to, by the time you actually train them up to be able to do what you need them to do, the project's over and you're right. done and you move on. But these kind of laws are made for these large projects that last years, right? Sure. Where this person is going to be employed for years maybe even. Um, but... It, for really, us, they, they still, it's never been something that it's just been an additional expense. That's too bad. Yeah, I get the get the why they why they do it though. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah. So navigating though this prevailing wage piece, I mean, is it different? So it's different state by state. Is it also different county by county? Yes. So the the state of California, or is it city or county, does it actually go down to the city level as well? No, it's county. Okay. Um. So. For instance, um, the wage will be different by county, huh? Right. So okay. the wage, and then also the diff there's different classifications. classifications. Wow. Okay. So um, in Santa Barbara County, for instance, they might have a different list of classifications than Los Angeles. Um, so determining which one you need to use to pay on your project takes some 
<laughs> I wouldn't say guesswork, but it, it, in parking, there isn't a classification for us. So you have to really read into the, the classification in their, um, uh, what is it called? The requirements. Of yeah. The job, the job yeah. The stuff, kind yeah. of like a job description, which there's not generic. Yeah, yeah. Very, very generic. So you have to find which one, you know, fits best. But my salary people, I don't have to pay them for prevailing wage, right? If they pick up a tool. They are considered eligible for prevailing wage, which means then... And that supersedes? Yeah. Oh, there supersedes the exempt. Really? Yes. So even if they're a salaried employee and they're picking up tools on the job... They are to be paid whatever that prevailing wage is. So you have to determine it. I mean, if Plus they're already... Overtime? Yeah. I mean, oftentimes salaried employees are making at least what the prevailing wage is or more. So then their regular rate. But yes, that's the biggest... Um, issue here is that well, they're paid qu- overtime. Here, well, here's a really good question then. So if they work overtime, mm-hmm. that I have to calculate? Because that, that supersedes the exempt law yes. for salary. What wage am I paying them the overtime at? The wage that they already get? Whatever their you current were ra- wages, mm-hmm. not the prevailing wage. If they're overpaid, so I still have to, wow. Yeah. So I had no idea. Yep, you have to pay them. I mean, it's just for those projects, they're not considered exempt. So what happens if I don't do this correctly? Like if I, I mean, it sounds like so complicated that if you don't have help that it's very easy to make a mistake. So what's the... So the worst of it is if you're determined that you're intentionally not following the law event, I mean, intentionally could be that this happens multiple times and you just don't get the help you need. Um, that they can ignorance. <laughs> yeah. They can ban you from working on public works po- projects. Um, we had a situation once where one of our subcontractors, um, didn't, that they didn't pick the right classification. And when we talked to the state about it, I guess this, this wasn't the first time for them. So the state said to us, I wouldn't hire them again. Um, they're on the, they're on their way to being banned at that point. They weren't, but they were on their way to being banned from, um, bidding on public works contracts. So... You don't want to be correct. You have to correct it though. Like say, oh yeah, and penalty. You have have to correct it. You have to correct it. So you have to then pay the employees what you were supposed to pay them, and then there's penalties by day. That every day that you didn't pay them the correct rate or overtime or whatever you didn't do, um, there's a penalty by day. But that doesn't open up like a can of worms on that because then all of a sudden, what about? Because it's typically not going to be just one employee. Oh yeah, I mean it can it can. Really hit your pocket if you don't do this correctly. How far back can it go? Can they go? Uh, I believe it's four years. Really? Um, yeah. So and then so it's there's penalties for everything. So there's penalties for not doing one thing. And then there's a penalty for the apprenticeship program. And then there's penalties for not paying overtime. And then there's all these things <laughs> that have additional penalties. So it really can, you know, it could be such a small amount that you were supposed to pay your employees. Um, you know, like the difference in, you know, one, they might've been making, you know, $20, $20 an hour and you're supposed to be paying them $30 an hour. Well, now you're getting a penalty of $150 a day on top of that. The penalties can end up being more than what you were originally supposed to pay. The penalties are payable to the employee or are they payable? No, they go to the state. They go to the state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. The employees, the employees, the employees do (laughs) get their wages, but, um, yeah, the state gets the, the penalty. Wow. So, so, but how do you determine? So I've heard that like when you're when you're say there's a requirement to pay them say fifty dollars an hour. I'm just making that up. Mm-hmm. How do you determine what they're actually the difference and what they're actually getting paid? Don't you get to take on like their yeah so there's and medical and so there is um and in most states I'll just say that there is a uh, you you are allowed to take the benefits, the uh, certain approved benefits off of the hourly rate. So if it's a $50 an hour rate prevailing wage and you're paying, you know, $6 an hour for, you know, the difference between um, health care, PTO, life insurance, all these things, um, 401k match, you can um, calculate an hourly rate and deduct that from the $50 an hour and then end up paying them. So you almost need to calculate that down to the individual because it's oh, based yeah. on their contribution and the medical benefits they have. And, right. Wow. And so it takes, I mean, some, some companies just decide to pay that $50 an hour. 
Um, but again, Administratively, year it sounds a little easier. Yeah, but it, it's it's a lot of work to do. Um, but it it's definitely worth it in the end. If you're going to continue to have public be on public works contracts, it's 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 a benefit to do that calculation and um, pay them thirty five dollars an hour versus fifteen fifty. <laughs> wow. So 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 what about so, okay. So what about service and maintenance? Is that is it only on the new installations, or no. is this service and maintenance as well? Again, if you pick up a tool, if you um, if you're doing software, no, maybe. But if you are picking up a tool and working on that equipment, it is it's also public works. It's prevailing wage. And if you're getting paid through a public contract, there might be a different then. classification. So oftentimes there will be like a construction piece of it, and then there'll be a service technician. Which sometimes the sometimes the service technician is less than what the the construction piece was, so it just depends on the what you do. So if you're gonna do this correctly, I mean, it, it, you you need help. Yeah, I, I mean, it's taken years for me to understand it, and to do this overnight, it it's a big risk. You need somebody that understands all of the pieces and the questions to ask because. The laws change too, so you have to keep up with that. They change them; they don't really notify you. You know that there's your contractor is not going to tell you that there's these new laws that came out. And sometimes there's like predetermined increases. So you start off the project at a certain rate, and then six months down the line, you have to redo everything because there is a predetermined increase wow. in the rate of pay. So what about? So if I want to avoid this on prevailing wage projects, I just or on a public works project, I'll just hire a subcontractor. I don't have to worry about it, right? Nope, that's, no. Nope. You, <laughs> oftentimes people think that that's the way to get out of it, but now you have the the, requ- the responsibility of making sure that that subcontractor is because the owner of the project, if you, they're not doing what they're supposed to do, the owner will be the one that's penalized, and then they pass that penalty down to you. And then you'll have to pass it down to that subcontractor. And oftentimes what happens is they've already been paid. So now you have to invoice them for that penalty. And if they're small, who knows if you'll get it back from them. So so how, um, I, so how do I make sure they're paying their people correctly? Well, you need to request their certified payrolls. You need to request, make sure that they're registered with the state of California for public works contracts. Or, you know, there's that they've requested their apprenticeships, their apprentice um, all of the things that you're required to do, you just need to keep, be visible that your subcontractor is also doing it. Because I have to pay if they don't. Right. If they haven't done those things correctly. You'll be penalized. Now, they'll end up needing to pay their employees. The correct, I say it's, you know, they've picked the wrong classification. They'll be required to pay those employees, but that penalty will fall on your, your company. Um, but That's like a pretty deep rabbit hole there just on yeah. public works projects so yep wow and it's it's um it's the risk to me sometimes i've heard come you know they just don't do it they'll just you know no, the risk isn't worth it often well, the penalties that really make yeah it- the risk is not worth it just you know looking the other way and pretending that you know or even just not taking care of making sure that you're paying yeah, the right the, side, the yeah. right rates and all of that Well, because it sounds like if you're trying if you have the goodwill to do it correctly just administering it properly can actually save you some money not just from penalties but you know being able to take into account all the other things that the employee is getting paid mm-hmm. um i guess it's easier just to pay them the flat out 50 dollars an hour or whatever right. it is but it sounds like you really could control your costs better on a large project if you right. were to actually try to do it correctly and right. incorporate all that stuff. And then, you know, if you're a subcontractor, um, you need to, up front, you need to make sure that you are including that cost in when you're your... proposing on the mm-hmm, project. Right. And so, and really, because you're responsible for um, ensuring that you're paying properly and all of that, that even just knowing that it's a public works contract, you need to be asking, you need to be ensuring that when you're going into a contract with general contractor or whoever, um, that is if it's public works or not. Um, it's they're not required to tell you that it is. Wow. 
They typically do because, again, they get the penalty then, you know, but they're sure. not required. They're not required to. Um, so you want you do definitely want to ask those questions up front. So this is an interesting segue when you talk about hiring subcontractors. Mm -hmm. So um, what's a really, you know, obviously all that stuff is you have to make sure that's, you know, defined type of project up front. But if I'm hiring subcontractors, is there like a, like what are the things I need to look at first when I'm actually hiring a subcontractor? Well, um, first of all, their insurance requirements. So, um, you want to make sure that they're able to comply with the project's insurance requirements. So your your insurance, if they don't have enough insurance, it, it, the the liability will fall on your company. Um, but of course, you don't want that to happen. So the, the not easiest a, not every project though is a part of like a big GC project. Some of it's just simple, like um, you know, you're working for a parking operator or something. You're installing product. Right, but that they will have insurance requirements. So from the company that you're working right. with, right? Okay. So wherever they are, wherever you're, they're working. You need to find out from them what their insurance requirements, and that's what you ask of your subcontractor. Now you can have a standard like minimum insurance requirements just across the board, um, <clears throat> but that's typically when you're using with vendors like you know your cleaning company and things like that, not subcontractors that are going to be going out and working for your customer. Okay. So um, you want to make sure that they're complying with their, their insurance requirements. But And then other things that to, to look out for in subcontractors are, you know, um, if, you know, in the industry, like what kind of reputation do they have? Are they, have you worked with them before? You want to kind of keep the same people so that you don't have to train people <laughs> over and over. And yeah, it does help out a little so, bit when you're not working with a new place. Yeah. So. Is, is there anything, so most subcontractors when they do work for you, they'll do things like, um, I know it's general practice to file a, a lien a, or a preliminary lien notice, mm -hmm. especially against a property before you go to do that. Um, what do I need to get from my subcontractor before I pay them? Well, the, the, the documentation from them. Now, typically, it depends on how s the smaller the subcontractor. They don't always do that, okay. but you can require it. So, so what so, happens if you don't file a preliminary lien notice? I, you know what? I, I don't know when it comes to the subcontractor side of things. I know that... Well, like for Even for... Uh, I mean, if you don't... Usually most states, like, I mean, I've heard that if you don't file it, then you don't get to, you can't file a lien labor. You can't actually file a mechanics lien unless you actually. Well, yeah, I mean, you have to file those first, but there's certain things like, for instance, if it's public works and you haven't paid them there. I mean, you can deduct things from the final payment without the mechanical lien. So there's other things that come into that just as a protection for you. Got it. So um, that kind of just states that this will happen if this doesn't happen. Got right. It. So, um, but you have, I mean, if they, if, the, if you've received the penalty in certain things with like public works, it's the law. So there's, there's not much they can do. Well, it's all, yeah, it's, there's I a, think the, the liens and stuff are more of like, if there's expenses for them not doing what they're supposed to do, then you can. Well, usually it's your only recourse if someone doesn't pay you. So right. if you're a contractor working on a project for a general contractor, mm -hmm. the mechanics lien goes against the building or the. You file the preliminary lien notice against the building so you can file a mechanics lien later. And then yeah. if you uh, if they choose not to pay you uh, in a timely manner, you have that recourse available yep. to you. But if you didn't you didn't file that up front, then you can't file it later no. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's something you certainly have to focus on. Yeah. <laughs> Making sure that you do. And that's just another <clears throat> administrative task or an understanding all of that for you know, smaller companies. It's going process. It just needs to be just part of it. But there's yeah. companies that do that for you. Like if you just, mm -hmm. you can, and it's pretty inexpensive to have them do that sort of thing for you. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. So um, really enjoyed talking to you about all this today, but you're, you decided to go out on your own. Yep. So I have worked for Century Control Systems, now Century Ski Data Group or Ski Data, um, for almost 13 years. So, um, and over that time I've learned a lot. And I want to continue to help people um, understand all of these, you know, best practices and um, the risks of 
running a business and how to protect themselves, whether it comes, you know, prevailing wage or um, employee relations or re employee retention, hiring, um, talent acquisition, planning of talent. Um, so I'm, there's a lot that I've had my, I've give, been given the opportunity to, to have my hands in and um, I'm excited. That's awesome. So what's the name of the company? It's called um, Real HR Hero. Okay. It's um, Thompson HR Consulting. But uh, it's more than human resources because there's been a lot that I've done in the past. Like we talked a lot about insurance and things. Of course, that's not human resources. But um, it's really just helping people with their daily professional services, support services. It's all those best practices things mm -hmm. like from so. So what, what's a list of things that you're planning to, to help people with? Um, so, the, the you know, I wouldn't say the basics, but, you know, if talent acquisition, payroll support. Um, um, what, about and, what about negotiating contracts with, like, payroll companies and stuff? Oh, yeah. So project management of those things. What's, what's necessary? There's so many out there, and they all promise that they're going to have, you know, the best thing available, but it really just depends on what your company needs. And oftentimes you don't need all of the things that they're trying to sell you. They make you think you do. And so because I've actually worked in that industry in the past and now worked on the other side of things, I, I know how to manage and the questions to ask to know what is actually needed. Um, so, yeah, managing those kind of projects. And, you know, uh, employee relations issues. Well, Multi-state like payroll, too, has got to be a challenge for yeah. businesses as well. Yeah. So And, and things are changing so much. Um, different overtime laws, different yes. minimum wages, different. Yep. So just being able to keep up with all of that stuff is a job in itself. So, um, do you see yourself being kind of more project based with companies? So like if they're trying to change medical insurance providers, they're trying to implement a new payroll system do, or do you want to, do you intend to do project based or do you rather be more retainer based or both? Probably both. Okay. Um, and really that it just, it needs to be, there needs to be a conversation of what's what's needed with the the organization that I'm working with. Um, oftentimes it will just be project based, but if they want to keep me on retainer, um, just where they, even if they have you know a ten person payroll that they want me to process every two sure. weeks or something, um, not to you know blow my own whistle, but I can probably do that with my eyes closed, you know, <laughs> ten people. But, um, but yeah, so it just probably both. Okay. Yeah. What's the, so what, is there a website? Yes. What, what is it? It's realhrhero.com. Nice. Is there a, what's the best way to reach you? Um, go to that website. There's a link at the bottom of the page um, to send um, an email to me or my phone number is listed there as well. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you for uh, joining us today. No, thank you, Lester. <laughs> it was nice. It was fun. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Bye. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the podcast, having a great time doing this. If uh, if you're enjoying it, if you're getting value from it, please leave some feedback. Please subscribe. There's a lot of people listening, not as many subscribers. So if uh, you could subscribe, comment, and share it, please share it with your friends. Share it with your family. Tell your mom. Tell your dad. Tell everyone. Thanks.